Hello everyone, I'm Natalia Bilbao, and here's what's happening in LA this week. Our world was changed just over two decades ago on September 11th. Los Angeles City Mayor Karen Bass joined with LA police and fire departments to commemorate the 22nd anniversary of 9-11. Together, they pledged to never forget the fallen heroes and first responders of that day. We're here to remember and honor those who lost their lives on September 11th. On this day 22 years ago, the unthinkable happened. All of us remember exactly where we were when we got the news. The world forever changed on September 11th, 2001. We're gathered here today to acknowledge those survivors who carry the scars of their grievous loss, while also honoring those who rushed headlong forward to serve others. I was in sixth grade when it happened, and so I, li I like to think back to the day that everything changed for a lot of us. A lot of my friends actually are veterans because they went to go fight in the wars that came out of what happened on 9-11. So it's about remembering all of these things. It's an amazing event so that we don't forget what happened on 9-11. You know, the famous slogan, we'll never forget. We all have an obligation and a duty to ensure that the generations who are coming up behind us understand this history and commit to never, ever forgetting our fallen heroes. Never, ever forget. These hours, days, and weeks following the attacks on 9-11 were spent serving this country. In such a dark time, the light of compassion shined through. I want to thank our first responders. I just think we should keep uplifting them and supporting them because they do so much for our communities. In the very midst of unspeakable loss, we came together and we cared for each other. 22 years later, I look to also to remind Americans that we stood together, we were united against a common foe. And in fact, as we asked, how can we remember these men and women, is to remind ourselves as Americans, we have a responsibility to find common purpose, to unite together, and to stand as one. Being paid less than the minimum wage, being denied rest or meal breaks, these are some of the types of wage theft that add up to $26 million every week. Councilmember Hugo Soto Martinez unveiled a package of measures to tackle this issue. Today, we're going to unveil an incredible package of motions that will begin the process of ending Los Angeles's dismal reputation as the wage theft capital of the United States. So wage theft is when a worker is not paid the minimum wage that they should, when they're asked to work off the clock, they miss their meal break, or don't get paid for overtime. We know that happens to a lot of working class Angelinos to the tune of over $26 million a week. We know that workers lose about 12.5% of their income to wage theft. It's in somebody's pocket, it's just not in the pocket where it belongs. We are looking to increase the resources and the awareness and the enforcement to make sure that we are sticking up for workers. And a lot of these folks are low wage workers, workers of color, immigrants. These are the cooks, these are the dishwashers, these are the housekeepers, these are the immigrants, these are the women of color. These are the folks that are most disproportionately affected. Mistreatment of workers has no home in Los Angeles. If we're not gonna stand up for each other, who is? So I came here on behalf of my own community, which is the black community, who are constantly being uh, discriminated against. So that black Angelinos have a fighting chance to avoid and remain out of being unhoused. Thank you. You know, having 40 or 50 more dollars in your paycheck per week truly, truly makes a big difference. When we think about why folks cannot pay a certain bill, when they cannot buy groceries, when they end up in the street, why they're dealing with issues of poverty, these little things do make a difference to the families living on the edge. Wage theft has no home in Los Angeles. And I want you to know that when you come for our workers, we're coming together and we're coming for you. When we fight, we win.
is a silent killer among us. Councilwoman Kitty Yaroslavsky and Councilwoman Monica Rodriguez recognized September as Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. They connected with the Ovarian Cancer Circle to help share the warning signs and raise awareness of this disease. This is my daughter, Robin, who I miss desperately. She lost her life at 20 to ovarian cancer. And this is the mission, this is my reason for doing what I do. We have a hashtag, no more Robin stories, and that's my goal. Before I die, I want to have a cure for ovarian cancer so women will not die from this disease. As a 20 plus year survivor of ovarian cancer, I gravitated toward uh, spending my time and my efforts fundraising with the Ovarian Cancer Circle because they're specifically working on something near and dear to my heart. We're going to be uh, recognizing Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month, which is a silent killer. It afflicts one out of 78 women, and uh, most people don't know about it until it's pretty far along uh, because there's no early screening. What has emanated from her tragic loss was the information sharing and the research that has gone into helping women identify some of the opportunities that they have to detect it early. Women's physical health, women's uh, personal health is something that always gets looked secondarily to some of the other priorities that women often face. And so this is a moment for us as women, as advocates, as parents, to continue to inform ourselves about prioritizing our own health uh, and making sure that we can avoid any further loss of life with early detection. So the symptoms are frequent urination, constipation, feeling full after a few bites, bloating, uh, possibly bleeding, nausea. So if you have any of these symptoms, see a gynecologic oncologist. You have to listen to the signs of your body and ovarian cancer is very subtle. It's very difficult because there aren't any tests yet that really put your finger on it. There are just several things that add up to the diagnosis. Ovarian cancer is different and it's not something that you're necessarily thinking about unless and until it, it afflicts you. And so really being proactive about it, making sure folks with ovaries are, are going and talking to their doctors proactively about it, just sort of bringing it up on people's radars is what we're hoping for. So we do give out bookmarks that talks about the symptoms and how to be proactive. Ovarian cancer gets misdiagnosed quite a bit. Most times women are sent to a urologist and our mission is to educate. So if you do feel the symptoms, you know to go to a gynecologic oncologist. Access to testing shouldn't be something that is available to some and not others. And so we need to be united in our advocacy to make sure that women have access to these types of early detection tests. In recent history, there was only one elected representative on LA's council who was female. Now there are seven. And for the first time ever, LA's mayor, city attorney, and fire chief are all women. Mayor Karen Bass, city attorney Heidi Felstein Soto, and fire chief Kristen Crowley were all honored at an annual event to celebrate women in Los Angeles city government. Well, tonight we are at Viviana in downtown LA celebrating the women of Los Angeles City Hall benefiting Casa of Los Angeles. This is an event that celebrates the women in front of and behind the scenes in LA City government. And tonight is extra special because our honorees tonight were Mayor Karen Bass, Fire Chief Crowley, and City Attorney Heidi Feldstein Soto. They are all the first women in those respective roles. It is great to be here, especially honoring two of my sister friends who I have the highest regard for. So here we are being recognized for being the first, for being the first female mayor, first female city attorney, first female fire chief. So just to have that recognition is, is really an honor, but really it's based off of all the hard work and dedication of all of our city employees, but you know, we recognize what it means to be the first, and it's really a significant historical time. It's actually a little overwhelming. The award is one of the most beautiful awards I've ever received. To be honored on the same stage as Mayor Karen Bass and Fire Chief Kristen Crowley is really a privilege. Tonight is a really momentous night. It's the 10th anniversary of our first event. 
When we started the event in 2013, there was only one woman elected official in the city of LA. Now, 10 years later, we are so proud to have nine women elected officials in the city of LA and an all-female board of supervisors for the County of Los Angeles. They're an incredible representation of what leadership looks like, what female leadership looks like. It feels remarkable. As a woman, we often have to fight harder than everyone to make a dent and an impact in the very communities we serve. And knowing that we are able to collaborate and work together and build capacity, knowing that we're stronger together and truly doing it in service of the communities that we share is extremely empowering and inspiring. These are the women of City Hall. First woman city attorney in the history of our city. We work in partnership with each other. And I think that's a little different because usually the mayor and the city attorney are kind of fighting each other. But one thing about women is that we tend to be a tad more collaborative. And what about our fire chief? What about our fire chief? All I can say is we are all aware of the weight of history and we are all determined to pay it forward and make sure that none of us is the last. Schools are back in session. These mornings are a little darker. It's almost officially fall. You might be thinking more of pumpkin spies than pedestrian safety, and that's why LAPD has issued a timely reminder about safety for all pedestrians, especially within school zones. Once school starts back up, you're going to have a ton more pedestrian traffic out on the roads. Specifically children, we want them to stay on the sidewalks. It's absolutely imperative that they're crossing in marked crosswalks. That's going to be best practice by far. So be on the lookout. Anytime you see another side street that intersects with your street, there may not be a light there. There may not be a stop sign there. Um, slow down. Look for pedestrians on the corners. And something that is kind of overlooked, if they're walking with their parents, we want them to be holding hands. Uh, when you're holding hands, you're kind of an extension of that person. You're a larger object for drivers to see. As a pedestrian, it's really important that you're looking out for your own safety. Wear bright colored clothing. As we get into fall here, it's going to start getting darker, so you know they can definitely carry glow sticks or flashlights. Stay off those phones. Stay off those tablets. Stay off of anything that keeps your attention looking down. So if you're a driver that's taking your kid to school in the morning, uh, the biggest uh, tip that I can give is to leave early. If you have that time, you're not going to get caught in that, that chaos that's like the last 10 minutes of the drop off. And so it's really important to leave earlier, give yourself enough time. Uh, the other thing I could say, it's very important that uh, drivers are looking out for signs. There's a lot of different traffic signs out there. You'll see school crossing, you'll see school zone. When you get into these locations where the schools are, it's really imperative to slow down. Remember, the speed limit slows down to 25 miles an hour. The faster that we are going, the longer it takes for us to stop. And you just never know when a pedestrian is going to come out between cars, even though they're not supposed to. These things happen. The other thing is that it's very important for uh, drivers to stop for buses that have their flashing lights on. Essentially what those mean is that that bus is getting ready to unload children or children are getting ready to board that bus. So it's absolutely important to you know, obey all the traffic laws and stop when you see that. For additional resources, reach out to lapdonline.org and there's just a wealth of information on there. You can also find out what division you live in and the patrol division that is responsible for where you live. The Los Angeles City Fire Department recognized apparatus operator Ryan Jensen for his swift action in saving the life of a young boy. On March 23, 2023, LAFD responded to a structure fire at a 211-unit apartment building where they encountered heavy smoke and flames. Amid the chaos of evacuations, Jensen saw a nine-year-old who got separated from his family and his escape route was blocked by fire. Jensen quickly operated the controls of his 94-foot aerial ladder, extending it to the balcony. He then brought the boy to safety. For more on this story, visit LAFD.org. September is National Preparedness Month, and the Los Angeles Department on Disability is sharing best practices for people with disabilities to prepare for emergencies. Using the theme, Take Control in One, Two, Three, Disaster preparedness steps include making a plan, building an emergency kit, and staying informed. 
people with disabilities may have additional considerations, such as evaluating the needs of service animals and creating a trusted support network. Whether it's for shelter in place or evacuation, an emergency kit may require additional items to cover daily medical or dietary needs. Stay informed, Sign up for notifications, know when to call 911 or 311, and use radio, television news, and social media to get official local emergency updates. For more information, go to ready.gov disability. Justin Urbachi, Chief Executive of Los Angeles World Airport's LAWA, has announced he will depart his role on October 6, following seven years with the City of Los Angeles. Mayor Karen Bass will conduct a global search for a new chief executive at the airport, which is now the sixth busiest in the world. LAX is preparing for the 2026 World Cup and the 2028 Olympics with modernization, which includes an automated people mover, consolidated car rentals, and over 2 million square feet of additional terminal space. Mayor Bass announced that day-to-day -day operations and major project completions will be managed by interim CEO Beatrice Hsu. Hsu is a 10-year veteran of the Board of Airport Commissioners, the governing body of LAWA, which includes LAX and Van Nuys airports. For more information, visit LAWA.org. The Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, aka Empower LA, supports the city's 99 neighborhood councils. Recently, they hosted an event for council members from every neighborhood to meet face to face. The first such event in some time. Take a look. Today is our meet and greet gathering. We are inviting neighborhood council leaders to come in and join us to meet our staff and meet the staff of other city departments and elected offices that support their work. Congratulations to all the new board members. The pandemic kind of put sort of a pause, um, so I wanted to re-engage everyone from since the pandemic and build those relationships again. LA's neighborhood council system is meant to provide community-based representation within each Los Angeles neighborhood. We have 99 of them all together. They can share solutions to the problems that they have in common, as well as get an introduction to how different parts of the city, how life is in different parts of the city. I'm a former neighborhood council member myself. Um, I served on the Pico Neighborhood Council. I have a lot of relationships. There are a number of people in this room who I've known for a while, and it's really a privilege to be back and to let folks know how much we value their contributions. I think the Neighborhood Councils are a very important part of our grassroots democracy. I'm an elected official. Uh, these are my constituents. The Neighborhood Councils you often serve as the first responders, if you will, to issues of community concern. They get to know what the problems are in each part of the city because there are different issues in each different neighborhood of the city. Neighborhood councils serve everyone who's a member of that community and part of the daily life there. What we hope that everyone gets from this event is that they come in, they meet a lot of other neighborhood council leaders. Our work is basically to be that bridge for neighborhood councils to um, you know, know that there's resources to them available. I hope they walk away with a renewed sense of faith and hope, um, not only in our city, but in the democratic process and in the fact that as volunteers, they're making a difference. LA Central Library is the downtown jewel in the crown of the city's public library system. With grand architecture, extensive archives, and particularly knowledgeable staff, there's always a reason to visit. Central Library is currently called the Richard Reardon Central Library. It was named that in 2001 in honor of one of our former mayors. We do have two buildings. We have our original building designed by Goodhue, which we refer to as the Goodhue Building. And then we have our 1993 extension, which we refer to as the Tom Bradley Wings. 
It's an art deco style. So it does have the very clear vertical lines, but then it has kind of the classical embellishments of the sculpture. And then of course we have our Egyptian pyramid on the top. So it is really a unique mixture of different types of architecture, but it is referred to as art deco more often than not. Central Library is eight floors of space. So we have our different subject departments, literature and science and history and social sciences. We also have our children's department. We were the first public library in the country to have a dedicated teen area. But now we've expanded where we have a computer lab. We have a popular library so people can just run in and grab things that are more current instead of doing heavy research. We have an Octavia lab, which is kind of our maker space. We have a literacy center. So Central Library has so many different things and we have our science department and now it's our Getty Gallery where we have fabulous exhibitions and we have a few exhibition spaces throughout the building. So the Central Library is absolutely one of the gems of the city of Los Angeles and our collections are massive so we do have circulating collections. You want to come grab Stephen King or Harry Potter we have all those and you can come just walk in and check them out but we also have really deep research collections and librarians who have a lot of special knowledge. We have a massive collection of close to 4 million photos documenting the history of Los Angeles from the 1850s to the present. We have map collection, we have a menu collection, we have an extensive cookbook collection, we have a patent collection, we have you know our own institutional collections. I know we have one manuscript dating back to the 1300s, so Central Library can do so many things for so many people. Not everything's online and we have the expertise to help people navigate um, the collections in our building. So come visit us. We're awesome. It's a free festival which is centrally located and it hits all the right notes. Council member Kern Prize dropped by to let us know more about the upcoming Central Avenue Jazz Festival now in its 28th year. Take a look. <laughs> Central Avenue Jazz Festival is a chance to really celebrate the history and legacy of, of jazz. Central Avenue was known as the epicenter of West Coast jazz in the 30s, 40s, 50s. So this jazz festival is a way to just commemorate that, to celebrate that, and to really enjoy some good jazz music in Los Angeles. So it's, it's coordinated by the council office, but we also have some very strong community partners, uh, Concerned Citizens and the Coalition for Responsible Community Development, are two of the main community sponsors that work with us, pulling together the talent. So we're going to be having not just music, but we'll be having uh, food and information vendors, uh, as well as an opportunity for folks to just have some fun. The cost is absolutely nothing. There's no, no monetary charge, no cost. This is... Uh, probably the last uh, free festival uh, in, uh, in our community in a long, long time. But there's no charge. We just encourage neighbors to come out uh, early, get a good seat, uh, and enjoy the festivities. We're excited about the lineup this year. We've got the award-winning Billy Childs, uh, along with Sean Jones. In addition, uh, there's Hubert Laws and Eloise Laws. Together, uh, they are going to be providing the kind of performances that we will never forget. Well, you can always contact our district office, 323-846-2651, or you can reach us online at www.centralavjazzfest.com. Who keeps track of everything going on in Los Angeles? In this week's feature story, Holly Walcott talks to Maria Hallbrown about her front row seat as LA City Clerk, the official record keeper supporting the mayor, city council, all of LA City government, right down to neighborhood councils. I'm delighted to be joined today by the LA City Clerk, Holly Walcott. So nice to have you here. So nice to be here, thank you for having me. What prompted your interest in this particular office in the first place? It's just fascinating to be on the edge of where everything happens. I mean, we're not necessarily the catalyst or a part of what is happening, but we're watching it and recording it all. 
So it's fascinating to be on the sidelines, I guess, and having a front row seat to what's happening in, in city government. As part of your tenure, have you been witness to something and been part of something that you realized, this is historic. This is something that people are going to celebrate in years to come. I, I find that swearing in Mayor Bass was fascinating. I mean, just to, to swear in the first woman mm -hmm. into office of the mayor, that was a huge honor. So every time I get to swear in any official, I, I, I feel grateful, especially when there's more women that join mm -hmm. because for so long, the underrepresentation. Yeah. What exactly does your office do when it comes to city elections? We're a non-political, non-partisan office. Yeah. So we're just trying to get information out that's factual. We're not trying to sway you to vote one way or another. We're just trying to, to make sure you know you have the opportunity to vote. The problem is registered to vote. Federal elections can be sort of sexy and everybody understands, so oh, the President of the United States. But really it's locally, it's your local council and mayor that decide where resources go, what streets get paved, you know, where there's stoplights. A lot of those things get handed on a very local level, and that's why it's really important to make sure your interests are represented. So if someone wanted to access all this wonderful information that you have captured? We are on all social media platforms. Um, but if you go to our website at clerk.lacity.gov, it'll provide all the information on where you can find us. All right. Well, thank you so much, Holly. This is fascinating. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> I appreciate right. your time. Thank you so much, Holly. Celebrate World Gorilla Day with the LA Zoo. Join the zoo over two days for lively talks and fun-themed events. On both Saturday and Sunday, the LA Zoo will host special events where you can join zookeepers at education stations and enjoy live West African music and dance, crafts, and hands-on activities. You can also check out the debut of a new children's book about their very own three-year-old gorilla, Angela. On Saturday evening, a discussion panel titled A Gathering for Gorillas will focus on the conservation efforts taking place with LA Zoo's Jake Owens. World Gorilla Day Weekend at LA Zoo is on Saturday, September 23rd and Sunday, September 24th. See the full schedule of events and more details at lazoo.org. Now celebrating its 17th year, the San Pedro Festival of the Arts showcases the city's vibrant art scene and this year's focus is on dance. Enjoy live performances from 18 different dance companies, featuring everything from ballet to Bollywood fusion. There will even be voluntary audience participation when the dancers teach some of their moves. With a raffle and community tables, this is sure to be a fun afternoon in San Pedro's Peck Park. Don't miss the San Pedro Festival of the Arts, Saturday, September 23rd, starting at 1 p.m. The festival is free and open to the public. Find out more at tryartsp.com. Illuminate the night with an evening of art and culture at the LA River. The city's Department of Cultural Affairs wants you to join in the fun at this Frogtown Neighborhood Festival, highlighting the Taylor Yard Bicycle and Pedestrian Bridge. Elysian Valley Arts Collective is encouraging everyone attending to bring the light by wearing lights or light up clothing and decorating the pathway with all kinds of illumination. Local businesses and art studios will host exhibits, live music, and poetry. Illuminate the Night is a fun free celebration on Saturday, September 23rd, starting at 6 p.m. See more at evartscollective.com. And that's a look at some things to do. And that's all for this edition. I'm Natalia Bilbao, and from all of us here at LA This Week, thank you so much for joining us. You can watch us online anytime at lacityview.org, and we're also on Instagram, Facebook, X, and YouTube. See you next time for more LA This Week.